each um, age group and the contact details for those. Uh, also, what they can expect. So, obviously, the price that they're going to have to pay to be in the club, uh, when what that sort of consists of in terms of kits, jumpers, and, and when they'll have to renew. Perfect. Absolutely terrific. And I think we can end the meeting there and get out of here. That was absolutely superb. You've covered all my points. Now, there's a few more bits that we want to cover tonight, but a really good example there of considering the kind of the wider picture other than just the actual let's get the players let's get them in the wider context uh, you mentioned about uh, helping the parents and the players to know what what to expect throughout the season which is really really big for us um so we'll, we'll pick up on some of those points later on so Stephen's spoken about the word of mouth the family dialogue we've spoken about welcome packs or the what the difficulty there from john around ha sometimes having to reduce numbers as you move up the age groups um, using schools, club and clubhouse rules. Interesting word of mouth coming up a lot, which is interesting. We'll pick on that in a, in a little bit. Uh, I like mini this one from Jenny, just one from Jenny who says uh, info on ethos and rules and so on. So that's a uh, that's a very good ethos there. I think you're touching on that in a bit, aren't you? Yeah, excellent. Like that, Jenny. Really clear. A handbook given out includes the ethos, the rules, subs, committee members, contact details. Brilliant. Club booklet and processes, staff groups share the information, terminal meetings and a welcome pack. Excellent. So there's some really good stuff going on and I'll be, I'll be cards on the table. We'll be essentially um, highlighting some of those later. So when we do get onto them, please do kind of share your experiences of using them and what works for you, what maybe hasn't worked. Did you have a welcome pack and has it adapted over the years? Have you kind of moved with the times a little bit to include stuff that's happened to you over the years? Um, and that will really help us kind of add, add the meat to the bones of tonight's presentation. Um, just a few bits that, well, a lot of what I was going to highlight here has been covered. The code of conduct one, the expected behaviours is, is something that we probably expect to see. Um, so why is this process important? The, the process of kind of the recruitment, the onboarding, the welcoming new members or existing members to kind of re-up the next year. Um, it kind of the process helps to set and manage expectations for the players and the parents and the guardians. And also importantly, and something we should never forget, the expectations for you as a club of your membership. And it helps everyone kind of uh, make everyone it, kind of it makes your life easier is what I'm trying to get at. If we're clear from the start, go, 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 where's that if we're clear from the start, we should make everybody's life that little bit more easier. And for you as club volunteers, the last thing we want you to do is be spending additional time on duties that that could have been cleared up if our onboard and welcoming process had been really clear for our members. So moving on to recruitment processes and what considerations do we need to have? So we've already kind of covered their welcome packs, finances and things like that, which is excellent. So first and foremost, I've already kind of mentioned this. Your expectations. For me, should supersede everything else. Your expectations, of your members, it can be easy to kind of get caught up in the customers always right or thinking about the service that you offer to your members. But don't forget that you as a club are, are there to provide football for players of all ages, all genders. Um, and it, it's important that, that people understand what your expectations are of them as well as vice versa. So it can be easily forgotten when we're kind of in this world of the customer's always right or I pay my sub, so I expect this. There is a bit of give and take in the grassroots kind of football world. And, and as volunteers, I know I keep saying it, but you absolutely have the right to expect a bare minimum set of standards from your membership. So really important. That's why we're going to cover the club expectations first. Right. First up, your code of conducts. Your code of conducts kind of help the club to define the expected behaviours of parents, players and coaches, as well as yourselves as, as club officials. And importantly, they can be referred to when required so if issues are happening they're easy to refer back to to say that is your code of conduct that is the expectation you are failing to meet this expectation that can be used for a variety of things poor coach behavior parents not behaving themselves on the sideline players behavior use of foul language things like that easy quick wins um almost i would imagine every single club on this call has, has either adopted 
the FA's code of conduct or you have your own. It's really important that we ensure that they do form part of your onboarding process because without that touch point to say, here are our expectations of your behaviours and here are the expectations um, from the club of its volunteer workforce. We don't have that clarity. So just out of curiosity, and you can just put a yes or an emoji, anything like in the chat. As clubs, do you mandate that players or parents or both, do they have to sign any sort of behaviour or code of conduct um, as part of their signing on process for yourself? So whether it's just a yes, a thumbs up, anything like that in the chat, just so we can get a feel um, for the amount of clubs that are doing that. So it's a resounding yes. Excellent. And for me, that's really good practice and something we'd really encourage. Um, a lot of what we talk about tonight is essentially going to be prevent work to try and get you to a point where when issues do come up, we don't have to commit and spend loads of time on it because there's real clarity for you as a club to say that is the code of conduct that you signed up for. So a resounding yes from the club so far. On to uh, financial contribution or finances from a club's point of view. The question that we, we'd like you to ask yourself is are the financial contributions for members kind of clear and transparent? And, and what we mean by that is not just the total for your subs, as well as kind of the structure, but also in terms of what about fines? What about cautions, red cards, misconduct? What about the kit, which I think Rich mentioned earlier? Who owns the kit? Or does that kit become property of the child after a certain amount of time at the end of the season? Are some parts of the kit owned by the players and the uh, players, parents, guardians? Or does the kit remain always the property of the club? So these things need to be clearly defined in your onboarding process. You would be amazed how many disputes I've had to, and I know Claire will have had to settle, that revolve around kit to the point of socks at times. This is how it, it can get to that level. So by being really clear in terms of what what is the financial contribution and what does that get for you we can prevent those issues kind of snowballing down the line and again for you for the clubs um or the clubs that do have um sort of a support mechanism for those parents that may need that extra bit of support or may be struggling with the cost of living crisis is that clearly defined also within your kind of um outward facing stuff for your parents and guardians, your me wider membership. So that is just something to consider around financial contributions and your expectations um, of your members. Around communication and attendance. Again, a lot of this is gonna be us saying, is it clear and is it defined? But are the expectations clearly outlined for your players, your parents and guardians in regards to the attendance and the, uh, your attendance expectations and the implications if down the road they're not being met, um, as well as their expected communication with coaches or club officials regarding absences. And I know this might, you might think, where are you going with this? It seems a little bit low level or a little bit petty, but for some clubs on this call, this might be quite important. If you if you are oversubscribed, if you have players within your squads that are training only because you were unable to register any more players, we do have to ask ourselves, is it fair if a player has signed up uh, but then fails to turn up quite regularly or misses large parts of the season without uh, any communication or correspondence with the club? Is that fair for the child that is training only? And again, if we're not clear in our expectations of of what can and can't happen at the point of signing players on, we can get caught in those situations. So that is just something to be aware of. And on the flip of that as well, and this one's one of my big pet hates, out of just fairness for our volunteer workforce and our coaches, there's nothing worse than planning for 12, 15 players and then five turning up to a training session. So while we making it clear as a club what our expectations are for, absences and things like that because that can start to play a big part in in how training is organized and training is managed and if we're only getting four or five but we've paid 60 pounds for a quarter of a 3g for example that can start to add up and start to have implications down the line so being really clear in our expectations and our processes around communicating with coaches and the, and the expected attendance um, of players is something that you may choose you may not may choose to look at moving forward now 
we appreciate that people have other things going on in their lives. They play other sports. They might have county badminton on a night of training. That's this isn't what we're kind of looking at. We're looking at for those ones where it is persistent over a long period of time, and especially for those clubs that may have a waiting list or training only players that cannot access the competitive uh, your competition fixtures because other players are in those spaces but don't attend. So we think it's a what well, we'd recommend having a clear process around that or a clear definition of your expectations as a club um, to ensure that we don't get caught in a situation where a player's not been attending, but we're unable to maybe have that conversation or approach that subject in, in the correct manner. You'll hear this a lot tonight, exit routes. Just get that on you, sorry. You talk. There we go. Um, so your exit routes. What is the exit route from your club? And what is your policy? Again, out of curiosity, if you can use the chat again, do you have a defined kind of exit route or a deregistration process at your club already? Whether that's within your, your club rules or if that's maybe on your signing on documents or your welcome packs and things like that. I love to use the word kind of releasing players because um, as a grassroots kind of organisation, that's not maybe the word that we're looking at. But there will be times where players do leave or are forced to leave your club. And I think we'd always just with that caveat that no, in grassroots football, we don't expect clubs to be releasing or deregistering players based on a coach's perception of that player's ability. That's not kind of what we're looking at. We're more looking into issues that have happened around the club or persistent behaviour issues and things like that. So we've got a couple of clubs coming back saying that they do, which is excellent. We'll cover later on some poor practice, which Claire will do, um, which we've experienced over kind of the last 18, 18 months. And it's interesting, Andy's just put that they do, but it's not fully documented. And you'd be amazed at how much, how many of these issues that have come across our desk could have been kind of prevented by having a real clear onboard process, which means when they do leave the club at whatever time that is, we've got real clarity to say, this is, this is the process, this is what you're entitled to, um, and this is what we will do as a club. So we'll come on to that a little bit later. So moving on, so we've covered your club expectations and please do always put the club expectations front and centre to what you do as an organisation. So important to remember that. So your player and parent expectations. What does their membership get them, essentially? That's what we're asking. Or what does it guarantee them if they sign up and they become a member of your club? Well, first and foremost, what are the training commitments from you as a club and the training offer for their for their sons or daughters or, or them as players? We're getting, we're getting into the nitty gritty of, is it a grass pitch? Is it an artificial pitch? Do you have a summer and a winter training venue or do you just train on the same site that's maybe a owned by your club and it's grass all the year round or we use the portable floodlights or we're lucky enough to have a 3G. So what is the training offer? How often? How many hours? And is there winter provision? Is that made really clear for our parents at the point of signing on? What competitions will we be entering as a team? So making it clear that we're the dog and duck and we'll be entering the Sheffield District Junior League, for example, there's then at least kind of an, uh, an acceptance of, we know how many kind of there or thereabouts fixtures that we'll be playing across the season. We know the season's gonna run sort of September to April and give them clarity around what the expectations are for the competitions and the games. The big one, subscriptions, membership fees. It's absolutely vital that this is clear for parents. First and foremost, the amount, so the total, but also how that is structured for payments. So we know as a, as a club network that a lot of football expenses kind of are up front. Um, and as clubs, we, well, as a county, we've always recommended on, I think two years ago today, we talked about getting ready for next season. We made a big deal about making sure that you get your finances in early and then drip feed it out across the season, which is always a recommendation. Um, but we also kind of recommend that clarity in, in how your subs are used or how the membership subscriptions are used. Not all parents, and, I, and I'll, I'll go through kind of a, a live example that I'm dealing with at the minute. Not all parents will understand the upfront costs of football. They also won't understand why maybe they're having to pay 
their subs in one at the start of the season or potentially kind of for the first three to four months, but the season's nine months long. This can be quite difficult at times if you've got issues where players are leaving midway through the season. We've got stuff like registration fees, we've got kit, we've got league entry fees, we've got affiliation, we've got training, we've got referees, the list goes on. Um, so it's really important that we're, that we're clear with that to help parents understand the associated cost with football um, and to help with our final point, which will be refunds uh, in a moment um, on, on the finance section. So I, I, just as a live example, I'm currently dealing with a, a complaint regarding a player that's left the club and has left the club pretty much 50% of the way through what we would kind of say is the, the season, the September to kind of April season. However, the team in question have had a, a quite an expensive winter training venue. The players have been kitted out. We've obviously had our league uh, affiliation fees, etc. that the club have had to have at their expense. The parent would like 50% of their subscriptions refunded. But when we when you do break that down, actually, well, a, a large portion of that money is gone. It's been spent. So it doesn't work um, for the club to say, absolutely, you can have that 50% back. They're of the position that actually, no, the kit was X, the training venue was X. And therefore, what we'll like to do is offer you a pro rata of the subscription fees minus the cost that we've had this season. As you can imagine, it's going back and forth, back and forth, because there wasn't that clarity at the point of the start of the season, of the onboarding process to say, this is what your subs are spent on, and this is our refund process. Um, so it is really common for that one to come up. And, and again, we're actually, although we were pretty much slap bang in the middle of the season, this particular team season is about 75% complete just based on their divisions and their fixtures. And again, that's not being taken into account by the parent in this in this example. They're just saying we left in on this date. That's halfway through. I want 50% of my subscriptions back, which it, it's not it's not going to happen. And actually, in that instance, I'm back in the club to say, stick by your guns because you are doing the right thing. But it is really common. It's the most common complaint we'll get around this it is around refunds and subscriptions. Um, so it can be difficult for parents to understand kind of the upfront costs. So making that as clear as possible um, will save you kind of time and effort down the line. Your kit and equipment stuff, again, we mentioned it earlier, but just making it really clear as to who owns what, if you were to leave, what needs to come back to the club, um, and is that whether is it a case of if you have if you're there for the season, the kit and equipment you had that season belongs to you, and then we move on to the next season, or is the playing kit going to be used again for the next uh, for the next season? All those things need to be outlined quite clearly because again, we get so many incidences where and, and sometimes it's the club this time, so the clubs will be withholding refunds based on the fact that they've not had their kit and equipment back, and you get a bit of a standoff because. We'll give you the kit back when we get our refund and it can go a bit back and forth. So, again, if we can make that really clear within your onboard process of if you leave the club, if you require a refund, we require X, Y and Z back to the club. At that point, your refund will be processed. And we've got a lot of clubs with a really well written, kind of really clear process on that, that I've they've sent that to me and I've been able to go back to the parents and say, this is what you signed up for. So when they get the kit back, they'll then process the refund. So something that we really recommend. And again, finally, the exit route, is it clear to parents? So as a club, do you have a clear process? And for the parents, the guardians, the players, do they understand what the process is if they want to leave? Um, and again, that links all to your kind of onboard process. So do they understand what they need to do, what they'd be um what they'd be able to get if they do leave for a portion or percentage of the subscriptions, the kit and equipment and, and all of that. What are they entitled to? So is that really clear at the point of onboarding and welcoming our new or existing members to our club for the 23-24 season? OK, I can see the chat's getting pretty, pretty lively. There's some good stuff going on in there. Uh, is there a template with all this on that clubs could download and update for their club? The difficulty with that, Linda, is that every club's a different shape and a different size. And, and 
to make a template, it's something I can look at doing, but there will be quite a lot of blank spaces because there'll be a lot of specifics to your club. But absolutely, if that is something that will be interesting, I can look to kind of pull that together as a template, similar to the FA ones, uh, where you can look to kind of input the specifics to your club. But I'll have to have a bit of a play and a little a go at that because it may be difficult with the different shapes and sizes um, of our clubs. I'm just having a look through the other bits. Is so it possible got to say... Jenny, again, saying about just having a default registration. When somebody registers to the club, they by default agree to the rules and codes of conduct unless somebody says otherwise. And I think it's an interesting point to, to look at. But also, if somebody said, I, I'm i not going to agree to your ethos, would you actually sign them anyway? You know, it's like I think you you know, if they if they came out and said, I'm not going to agree to your rules or codes of conduct or your ethos, I think you'd be like, well, bye bye then, find a different club. Um, I think for something like photo consent, that would be a relevant thing to not agree to because of uh, potential safeguarding or um, protection issues. No, I, that's a really interesting point. I think I would challenge it as well. I think Claire makes a valid point. We absolutely, if someone was to say, no, I don't want to, you'd be asking why and are these the type of people that we want as members? But I would also say a challenge. Can we maximise that that mandatory contact point? It's similar to us as a county FA. Affiliation is our one and only guaranteed touch point with every club in the county. So what we try to do is maximise that opportunity to make sure it's a great experience for you as clubs, that we get you some clear information and we ensure that you have a, a smooth process. This is kind of, for you as a club, your one guaranteed touch point with those parents. So can we maximise that process? And rather by default, I'm not saying ram it in their face, but could it be, thank you for signing with the club and here are our policies and procedures in a nice little welcome pack. Um, if you've got any questions, kind of come back to us from there, but making sure that we maximise that. And, and like I said, put it in their face so then there's no excuse then in six months time if there's a complaint you can fall back and say well i sent you this email on the 10th of august that outlines our refunds in terms of conditions there we go so that uh, is a very interesting point and i think if you are going to go with the default again it's important that the, the policies and your procedures are front and center and, and, and easily findable um for your your membership because if they're not that would be getting into a grey area where if, if they can't find your refund or your terms and conditions and also you've said you've signed up to it by default that might be uh, that might cause us issues down the line so just something to consider and i'm just checking if there's anything else i think we've got it all okay so i'll move on hold on which i click through i've clicked through We'll come on to philosophy and exit route, with, which we've just covered. OK, so final considerations. We'll quickly run through this. What is your actual process uh, for signing on your members? Is it a formal process? And by that, I mean, are we getting them to sign something? Who's signing? Is it is it player and parent? Is it parent or guardian uh, and vice versa? These are all things to consider. And the big part around your kind of signing on process, is it clear and is it easy to understand so that if we as a club, if a parent or a player or a guardian need to refer back to it at a later date, is it crystal clear? Um, and, and for me, that's the challenge. And that's why I, I like Linda's idea of, of maybe that template to try and add some clarity to it. Um, but it's got to be nice and clear. Um, oh, I'm just going there. So I'm just catching up on the chat because I've gone right to the top. An electronic form. Interesting. So um, I've, I think I've written on here. It might be down the line, actually. It's on the next slide, I think. Um, Kate, would you mind unmuting and just kind of explaining your electronic form a little bit, if if you're willing to? Yeah, um, we, we, we've we trialled this year with the Google's form, so basically mimicking everything that's on the um, previous paper document, just to make it a lot smoother, cut down admin, cut down costs for the club, and it speeds the process up as well. Awesome. Are you are you getting the parents to kind of tick a box to say by ticking this block box, I'm agreeing that my son yeah. or daughter is a member of, of the club? On there, um, adhering to photo consent, etc. And then at the bottom, it outlines that they agree to um, conform with all code of conduct, etc. That the club runs. It seems to have worked well. The only thing that we've said for next year is at the moment we we've done one for parents just to complete across the board. 
but next year I think we'll probably do several one per team just to make it easier so we can share it a bit more simpler with managers. Okay and if for you as a club how has that, has that sped up your admin or made your life a little bit easier? Has that? Yeah 100% because then obviously the secretary can then copy and paste um, any information that they need to into the whole game system etc so it has saved a lot of time being down at the club i mean so we've got about 21 teams at millmore so it has helped quite immensely now that's that's excellent you've you've, you've sort of beaten me to it because that's going to be on one of the slides later so i'll be able to i'll be able to skip along that bullet point but for me i would seriously recommend looking into using google forms they're really simple to use um in terms of gdpr as well as long as you ensure that the access rights are closed and only there for the club officials it's not pieces of paper, it's not loose pieces of paper being handed in. It's all electronically stored. And I think like Kate's mentioned there, that that ability to be able to just copy out and go bang, put that, that's the information the coach needs, that's the information the secretary needs, and we've got all the consents and the agreement. And the best bit is, because I'm looking at my Google Sheet for tonight, it's time stamped. So when you are saying you agree to our terms and conditions or you agree to the membership rules, you did that on the 3rd of August, um, 2022, uh, and and it's there in black and white. So I'd really recommend exploring and looking into that. Um, terms and conditions for your signing on process. We're not asking you all here to be kind of legal experts. That's not what we're getting at, but we're linking back to kind of the refunds and the kit in particular that are quite common issues that come to us um, as to just make it really clear as to what can be refunded and what the structure of a refund process might look like. Um, so you might ring fence some of the upfront stuff to say that there'll be no refunds given on that, but we might pro rata, for example, the training fees or how it depends how yours are structured. But if they're paying, if they're paying in blocks and not paying the weekly stuff for training, you may pro rata the remainder of the season, for example. Um, what kit is owned by the club and what kit is, um, what kit is owned by the club and what kit needs to come back to the club. Um, what can happen if behaviours fail to meet expectations, for example, is something that needs to be really clear and upfront. Um, and this can all be referred back to should any disputes or should any issues arise during your season. So I know I'm using T's and C's, but we don't need to be legal experts. But what we're trying to get at there is to just make it really clear on the stuff that that may cause issues down the line. Can we get up front and get uh, ahead of that when we're on board and welcome those people to our clubs? And then finally, We've mentioned it earlier around your kind of your signing on events or your welcome packages and uh, just a few recommendations from us really it's, it's just something that we, I, I know Claire is and I we're quite passionate about this as a, as a really positive experience for you as clubs to not only get the information out that you need it's a nice touch point with the families around your players it's a great opportunity to listen to the voice of your parents it's a great opportunity to listen to the voice of your players more importantly so as well as being this kind of formal evening you can make uh, there's loads of examples and i'm sure we'll get a few in the chat in a minute of of the fun events that you put on that kind of that hide your kind of signing on evenings i've seen loads of examples over the seasons where there's been bats castles and all sorts and the parents are in doing their meeting and then the players come in for their team photo and things like that so we really recommend it and just a few key points for us it's an opportunity to set the scene and the expectations which again we keep coming back to expectations is really important um it's a club make it a club approach so the committee coaches players parents guardians an opportunity to answer questions and be really really transparent and getting your comprehensive list of documents and policies out to your membership so recruitment processes top tips Display your club philosophy publicly. We'll come on to that in a moment. Have a sign in on event. Send a welcome pack. Have an agreement signed, and that might be electronically. Have clear T's and C's. Make sure you refer to your finances, your refunds, subscriptions, kit equipment, and be transparent on what the subs money is spent on. If, and again, we're not saying you have to, but if you want to be, and especially if you are um, one of those clubs that is quite front heavy or does have winter training costs that then can't be refunded later in the year. OK, I promise Claire I was going to be quick tonight and I already know I've looked at the clock and I'm scared. So I'm going to be really quick on this bit. So club philosophies. When we say philosophy, I'm not asking you how do your teams kind of play out from the back or do they lump it into the big centre forward? We're more talking about kind of what do you stand for? Um, and what's your offer 
to your players for football. So let's throw this stuff around it. When they're on the pitch at training, when they're on the pitch on a match day, what is your offer to them uh, as a club? So we mentioned expectations earlier. I think I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna breeze through this bit. So if you do have a philosophy, just give me a thumbs up in the chat. Um, we'll maybe come back to this. We get a bit more time later. I want to run through the the philosophy bits. So we mentioned expectations earlier. Your philosophy is kind of it's the on pitch commitment that we've mentioned a moment ago to your players. Um, it needs to be clear. We recommend that it's club wide to prevent, and this is another issue that me and Claire deal with, to prevent individuals running their own mini club within your club. You can't be everywhere at all times, and we don't expect you to be. So having a clear philosophy for your coaches, for your players, for your parents and guardians, for you as a club, ensures that there is that kind of consistency across the board. In almost all instances that come to us, based on complaints when players are leaving clubs, Almost all of them will go back to football with football being at the heart of it for a variety of reasons, which we'll cover. Some as simple as my kid's not playing, it's not fair, and they're probably right. But we get ones where it's as simple as the team keep losing and I want to leave and they won't give me a refund. Well, you signed up for a development team whose club philosophy was all around development and not results. So actually the club are well within their rights to, to stand firm. So you, we get it at, at both ends of the spectrum. So it is important to highlight that. But almost all complaints that reach us are based on um, football related issues and they lead to, they then lead to kind of disputes or fallouts or players leaving and, and so on. So by ensuring that your club has a clear and transparent offer, members clearly know what they're signing up for and that's the key. They know what they're signing up to. It can help again to provide clarity if there's disputes down the line, like that example there. We're leaving because we lose. You signed up for a team, a club that don't have, don't play to win at all costs. We play for the fun and enjoyment of football. So you won't be receiving a refund on this, on this uh, issue. So important things to consider for those currently with one, like Elaine, I can see Elaine's thumb up, and those without. First and foremost, your playing time commitment to players. Are you an equal playing time club? Also things to consider around that. Is that game to game? So every game, every week, every player is guaranteed equal time, or is that equal playing time across the season? And by that, I mean, sometimes you can be tactical with equal playing time and, and not as a negative, but if you're playing the top, top team in the league this Sunday and you're playing bottom of the league next Sunday, it might be the coach's discretion to play some of the perceived stronger players for more minutes this Sunday. And then we boost the other players' minutes the following Sunday. Maybe some of those perceived stronger players play less the following week. So you can be tactical with it. So it's important to outline, is it every Sunday or every Saturday? Everyone gets equal time or is it across the course of the season? And also a question to ask is, is that policy from 6 to 18 or is that 6 to 11 and then we start to adapt it? Make sure that that's really clear. Your commitment to playing positions. Are you and everyone gets a chance to play everywhere and develop their experiences all over the pitch? Or are you a club that allows the coaches to kind of pick and players play in a set position? And you'll be amazed how many um, social media posts I see of under eight clubs looking for a, a solid centre half or a a goal scorer, they're six, they're seven, they're eight. We don't know what they are yet. The Edison's a great example at Man City. He played centre mid until he was 14. He's arguably the best goalkeeper in the world. So that just shows how how little us as coaches can really know what's going to happen in 10 years' time. So what's your commitment to positions and do you deliver on that? And does again, does that adapt with age? Do we say everyone plays everywhere to 11 and then we start to specialise as we get older from 12 to 16 and then into your real competitive football are you a development club or a winning at all costs we're not going to tell you what you should be we know what you, we think you should be but if you are a development club it's important that we live and breathe that um, and make sure that everyone is getting that fair crack and that ability to play in all games against all uh, opposition we do have we do have teams and clubs within our county that that do have trials they they do deregister players based on perceived uh, lack of ability for that group and that do enter leagues to win them each to their own 
but make it clear if that's you that that's what it is when they sign up because the last thing you want to do is say we're a development team and then a player doesn't get to play because there's a perception that they're not as good as the others or we've got an important game so actually that player's not playing this weekend so this is why having a clear philosophy is really important what about tournaments and cups or competitions and by that i mean for those of you in the lower age groups that will be playing your development fixtures if you're under eight, you'll have three two week blocks of permitted competition each season within your league structure. Are we staying true to our values in that? Or is it actually when we go to the competitions, when we go to the summer festivals, when we enter a county cup or the league cup, we're going to play that to win? And again, there's no right or wrong answer. But if that's your position as a club, is that made really clear at the point of signing on? Under 13s, boys and girls, county cup competition. When the team plays in these fixtures, the managers will be selecting based on their perception of the strongest team to win the game on the day, for example. So are you making that really clear? And then the last couple, your club coach philosophy and behaviours. It's just ensuring that they align to your club's philosophy. So if you're a development club with equal playing time, equal position time, are your coaches living and breathing that? Um, just to ensure that there's no inconsistency that may lead to complaints. And then discipline. Are we consistent and fair with our approach to discipline issues? Um, so there may be times where people do lose their rights to play equal playing time, for example, based on disciplinary issues that could be, they could actually be cautions, red cards, misconducts, or actually it could be behaviour against the code of conduct and expected behaviours of your club. Um, so are we ensuring that as a club we have a nice, consistent and fair approach to dealing with discipline? So. A well written and clear, sorry, I'll read that again. A clear and well written club philosophy should confirm your offer to its members. It's a clear and transparent commitment at the point of signing on. It should set the expectations of what players and parents can expect. It should ensure consistency across the club. It should prevent managers operating in silo, which we get quite regularly. Um, and it should help to manage player, parent, guardian related complaints as and when they come up. So, by having these philosophies in place, our values, they're on the table for everyone to see. Everyone knows what they're getting. And then if we do get issues, so the example being a, a player's pulled because the team's losing each week and they want a refund, well, hold on a minute. You're not giving us any time now at March, for example, to get another player in. You signed up for a development team. Unfortunately, there'll be no refund in this example. But on the flip of that, if a player's getting no minutes at a club where it is about development, it's about equal playing time, Actually, that parent could be well within their rights to complain and, and seek um, to deregister their child from the club. And then uh, you may feel actually yeah, we've not delivered on what we promised. We'll deal with that as a club, but we are willing to give you a refund as we've not delivered on that on this occasion. Um, so your club philosophies are, are vital and we recommend that you have them kind of customer facing or members facing really clear. And you can use that also as your marketing um, if you are going to shout about how inclusive and how welcoming and equal playing time, and etc. Fun, safe and engaging. It's it's all there and the type of things that parents will and parents of guardians will want to see at the point of picking the phone up or sending a message to you as a club. OK. So I got through it all in twice as long as I told Claire it would take me. So on to the deregistration processes and Claire's going to run through kind of a few scenarios um, and use them to kind of discuss the importance of your clear deregistration process. Like I said at the start, um, for us, by onboarding members in the correct way, that is your deregistration process because at the point they come to leave there should be real clarity for them to say this is what i signed up for and i'm now leaving based on x y or z or i'm now leaving and i'm entitled to a refund or i'm leaving and I here's your kit so by having a really clear onboard process we hope that that will then prevent issues down the line um, so deregistrations can and they do happen. It's a variety of reasons. Players could be moving away. They could be unhappy at the team. There may have been some behaviour issues. The list goes on. They should never really be for us in the grassroots community based upon a coach or a couple of coaches perception of a player's ability. Um, so working through the scenarios, we hope to demonstrate why the process is important uh, as well as what your processes should and should not include. So I will pass over to Claire. I'll click along one. <laughs> Hello there. Yes, so 
Um, one of the reasons I was very interested in this particular topic is I get a lot of club welfare officers that will call me for advice on, on this particular issue of, around deregistration, as well as parents that will phone me up to kick off about the, uh, the way they, they think it's unfair treatment. Um, and what tends to happen is that within the club structure, everything's going fine. There's not an issue. This hasn't come up before particularly, so they've not needed to think about a process for it. And then all of a sudden something comes in that's very complicated and you've got four committee members spending hours and hours, um, at, you know, in the evenings, at weekends, sometimes being bombarded with calls and messages around actually something that if the process is in place in the first place, you could just have sent them that and go, that's the process. You agree to it and then block their calls. <laughs> Now, we wouldn't always say block parents' calls, but um, the people that have been involved in these sort of issues will understand what I mean by that. So I just uh, picked a, a few scenarios that are, are pretty much real life cases for things that I've dealt with. And I'm sure Tom's dealt with and other colleagues at the FA, at the county FA as well. Um, some of them you might recognise because you'll have had something that's very similar because these are real life scenarios. Um, so here we've got in scenario one, Ms Jones, that could be uh, Ms Anything or Mr Anything, takes exception with the manager's decision to sub her daughter during a fixture. And then, because people like to be very public about this, puts scathing comments about the team and the club on a public social media. The manager sees that and decides arbitrarily, set straight away says, I'm sorry, but uh, that's it. I'm de you know, the manager gets really cross. I'm deregistering your daughter. She's no longer available at the club and then removes Ms Jones from the team's WhatsApp group straight away. So then the next bit that happens is a parent has no method of communication with people. So she complains to the FA safeguarding team saying that the manager is a bully and has emotionally abused her and her child. Now, has anybody on the chat had anything similar to this or had uh, had issues with social media posting? Um, if so, just uh, um, put a yes in the chat and I might pick on you, um, which will stop people putting a yes in the chat. <laughs> um, some of the issues are it. Yes, John. <laughs> what uh, if you don't mind of muting and giving your a uh, little bit of an experience? Uh, uh, that would be great. I, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, I, uh, so basically we had a, a kid who um, <clears throat> was misbehaving. We told the parents uh look guys the behavior is not cool um can we have a word and the parents sort of did that sort of not my little johnny he'd never do that sort of thing um then we invited a parent to, to uh training the kid behaved better carried on a bit a week later so we sort of told the parent again and they sort of just blamed us for it uh and then went on a bit of a sort of social media tirade against Mm, mm. Uh, um, which you know is very difficult and your instinct is always is of course to try and defend yourself but um we just sort of stuck with the the rules and regs and the sort of deregistration process and sent our club uh safeguarding office around to see the, the family and just sort of dealt with it in a sort of procedural way you know yeah absolutely yeah that's so important isn't it because if you've got that procedure there, thank you very much for sharing as well, John. It is annoying when people go on a social media crusade. Social media and appropriate communications should, of course, be in that um, code of behaviour as well, because it is much more prevalent. Everybody uses social media, so that kind of cu communication needs to be in there. In this situation, it is it was unfortunate that the manager took that instant reaction. And actually, it is much better if you if it's dealt with um, as a committee, because then it it means that as you know, John says, it means you're then dealing with it procedurally. And if somebody then continues to say this is a problem, this club's done this, this person's bullying me, this is emotional abuse, you can say, well, actually, the procedure was followed. And um, you know, we go back to what we said at the beginning of the season or when the player registered in the first place. Um, so often people do complain to the FA safeguarding team. The other element of this, of course, is that then it means that for the manager, it's a very stressful situation, too, because they're being directly accused and the a good procedure and process helps to support your managers and coaches uh, within the club structure too. Toma asks, next slide please. So here we go, under 14 player Josh, he started swearing at the manager and the relationship had broken down, he stomps off, kicks off all the time. However, the parent of course believes it's the manager's fault because the previous management team were much better and were you know able to deal with Josh. Um, so they've made a complaint to the club, 
which upon investigation, the committee thinks that the manager doesn't need to be sacked, despite the parents uh, saying so, and that they will do some of the support work, get them on some development training instead, maybe one of Tom's CPD events um, or observations. Um, however, the parent continues to complain and then the other parents get involved and the committee then come together to decide to deregister Josh. At this point, of course, the parent calls the county FA because they're disgusted that they've not received the subs back um, and they start making this massive complaint about the club again. Um, so sort of things to pick out there is that the club did a very, very good investigation in this case. They looked at a lot of different options for the manager and also fundamentally looked at is there a way of keeping this player in the club? but then decided that um, because of the tension that was being caused, that wouldn't be feasible. However, they had a good complaints procedure, good process, um, had other elements in there. So when I went back to the club to ask for any details, they were able to send me straight away everything that they'd done. So I went back to the parents to say, um, yeah, no, no deal. Everything's been done properly. Um, and then when it comes to the subs, the, it's, yeah, you've this is this has all been done properly and in thorough process, so uh, they didn't receive any subs back in that particular case. Uh, scenario three, Tom. Mr Bond has his superstar footballer Alex. Um, always wants to play uh, throughout every match in the position. Um, thanks, David. Um, the, the, and so again, you know, Alex is quite happy. He just wants to be involved in football. He's actually not bothered. It's the parent that wants um, Alex to be the striker or centre midfield or whatever is the important position in football. Um, so actually, this starts to cause the manager distress because of the allegations that are coming through that the manager is bullying their child. Um, has anybody had a, a situation similar to that that they've um, they've had to deal with? No, well, I know that people have, but possibly uh, it's coming to the end of the session and people might not necessarily want to share. <laughs> John, John, has, <laughs> John, John, you've had everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was the it was the same uh, people for the, ah. for the sake, but the the mother of this kid, rather than sort of accept a child's, you know, role in it or went on kind of saying that, making a bunch of sort of unfounded allegations against me and my lads who, Help oh, me, me coach um which you know our safeguarding officer fully in investigated it mm. um but it is you know it's very distressing when people are sort of saying yeah. stuff about you as we are all we're volunteers aren't we and we yeah i mean what what i was gonna put is that i kept a personal log throughout all of this as advised by good. our uh safeguarding officer just so that like when it came to if it ever came to at the point of it sort of being investigated or whether we could say look this is what happened at training on this day this is what happened on Sunday this is what happened at training and then you've got sort of a, a kind of an historical account to go back to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a plus a plus also took to communicating via text message after a while rather than via phone call just yeah. because I think that sometimes gets into like he said she said thing yeah so um, there's no written record of of the conversation that's the thing and then as soon as this these allegations were made I just said look it's all written down you can see so what yeah. this person's saying is entirely unfounded mm -hmm. um and I think that's the thing that sort of we were then backed by everyone after that really I mean it's you know it's perfectly people are perfectly entitled to decide on the method of communication that they want to use so if you get to a point with that and you say we're no longer accepting phone calls we're actually do all of this through email or through text because we need that written record and also because why should you accept phone calls at sort of 10 o'clock at night from from parents that are still wanting to go around the same um, same churn? And sometimes you have to just manage that and say, no, this isn't acceptable. Um, we'll pick the time that we communicate and the method of communication as well. And again, a, a, you know, the process will will allow that. So there was just a, um, a very quick last one here. This is a, a, a very, very tricky situation. This was in a club where the parents had split up and the dad wanted to take the child to a different club and actually had made an approach to the club and said can I register my child and the uh, the club had said oh yeah that's fine but then mum didn't want to deregister the child from the other club so that that did get pretty pretty hairy um, and ultimately what happened with that is that the, the two clubs decided to talk to one another to actually get straight what they felt was the best thing in the interests of the child and to really put the child at the centre of it and one of the things that we have to remember about deregistration is that this is you're not only deregistering the child, you're deregistering a parent. 
which sometimes for some parents, particularly in this situation, mum had a lot of friends in that club and actually it was going to be a big, uh, make a big impact in her life if she lost that social element as well. So the consideration can sometimes be around the impact on, on the rest of the family too. Um, but that's, I shall move on from my scenarios, Tom, because I think we're, you know, people started to be running out of time. Yes. Okay, I'll wrap through the last bit. I think um, I'll, I'll let you read through that slide at your own time. I think <laughs> I've noticed kind of sitting back and just watching the last 10 minutes that a lot of this might have come across as oh, all these horror stories and negatives. But I think what we're trying to get at tonight is let's let's cover our backs for those kind of what if moments. But also your onboarding, your welcoming process for your club is a really, really exciting and positive time. Um, and you can really kind of, um, I'm trying to explain it, you can really set the tone for the season of what you're about, how positive we are as a club, all the exciting things that are going to be happening. And here's what we're going to do for you as a as a member, as a player, as a parent, as a guardian. So we really want you to try and maximise the impact of that touch point at the start of the season. But by providing the clarity, you can kind of cover your backs for anything that comes down the road. Um, but you can also really, really draw up the interest and excitement. And again, that could be part of your marketing or your advertising for new players to shout about what your club's offer is to its members and what makes you different and what makes you so good. Um, so I'm conscious that we have we've covered the horror stories at the end and I've talked about a few kind of negatives throughout the night. Um, but on those kind of deregistration don'ts, just the ones we've had some bad experiences with over, do not allow an individual to make that decision without consulting the wider club. It should never be one person making a decision for whatever that reason is. It should never be done by WhatsApp or text message. That one is a big no-no. Um, always go through your processes. It should never be on the back of a poor game or a perceived poor performance. Uh, never make a decision without checking the wider context. Um, so things like attendance that could be that could have gone down, but there could be issues at home that you're not aware of. Um, and then finally, don't make exemptions against your philosophy. And this is more maybe for your coaches and things like that. But if your philosophy is it's, it's development, it's equal time, it's equal positions. But you've got one team, as I mentioned, operating in silo playing to win. Don't make exemptions for those people, uh, because what they will do is they'll impact the, the your good name of your club. Um, and they'll cause you problems down the road. So that's just a few deregistration don'ts from us. Um, so you could, like we mentioned, your clear onboarding process should give your members all the information they need as and when they leave the club. And look, some people might be leaving the club for positive reasons. It's not always going to be negatives. It might be moving abroad. They might be signing for a professional club, for example. The, all of these things. So by having those clear processes in place, um, it's not all about subs that we've mentioned. It might just be about making your life easier. You've left in March and here's what here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you April and May subs back. Thank you for your time at the club and goodbye. Bang. Easy peasy for you as clubs. Um, so we've got through the content. We're four minutes late, so I do apologise for that. That was me suggesting I could get through my slides in 20 minutes. Um, so if there's any questions, myself and Claire will, of course, be staying on until the end. Um, if there's any questions about anything else in the club landscape that you'd like to ask, again, I'll be here. I'm normally on for about another hour after these kind of helping people on the club portal. So I'll be here if you need me. Just uh, a quick catch up on what's coming up. We have a grass pitch improvement workshop this Thursday at Rosington, Maine. If you or your club are passionate about improving your grass pitches, not one to be missed. Um, you can still sign up for that. If you can't find the link, just send me an email and I will add you to the uh, workshop. It'll be a really good night with myself and Leon covering the Football Foundation funding um, and Chris Hunter from the Grass, oh no, Grounds Management Association. Is that the right? Whatever it is. The GMA, that's what they're called. The pitch experts, he'll be delivering the workshop. It'll be a great night. Um, the Grassroots Awards are now open for nomination. So please, if there's people within your club that you think are heroes, get on there, click, look at the different awards that are, you're able to nominate for and please do nominate them. Um, it's it's such a, our award ceremony, I can't remember when it was now, before Christmas, is just one of those nights where you sit back and think, wow, there's so many good things happening and we really want to capture that because again, it's not just the winners that are, that are kind of um, celebrated. We try our best to really kind of celebrate and signpost to those kind of grassroots heroes within our local, within our county. So 
Um, we've got a female coach support session coming up. So again, if you've got coaches within your clubs or organisations that are aspiring to coach or are currently coaching, um, it's at Kiverton Park on Wednesday the 19th of April. Um, it's all around the step principle, but it's a nice real beginner's look at coaching for female coaches. Again, the link is on. You can sign up direct through there or contact me directly. Club Welfare Officer Survey, Claire. Yeah, so I'm just going to be sending out a, a survey again soon for the end of the season to see if there's any areas that people particularly require support or any themes for a club date night that anybody, anybody would like, plus some other questions as well. So when I send that out, please do fill it in and return it. Thank you. Um, Football Foundation Energy Fund was only announced yesterday, so please don't ask me any questions on this. I've not even been able to <laughs> click and go through it yet. But in short, it's a pot of money for clubs to tap into to look at energy saving um, ideas and stuff around your club. So please do click the link and check that out. And um, there may be some funding there for you to look at reducing your energy bills, heating bills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So worth looking at. Finally, the next club update that I promise. I will not go seven minutes over on, is all around affiliation. For those of you who don't know, next year, or sorry, the 23-24 season, affiliation will be a totally different process for you as clubs. It will no longer be on the whole game system. It will be on the club portal. Um, so we will be going through the process. We'll be going through the new things you need to know, um, the new automated process that will be speedier and quicker for you as clubs. Um, so we'll be doing that. Um, in fact, why have I not put the date on? It is in April. I'll confirm the date momentarily. Um, but the link there will take you straight to our page, um, which has all the information on the date that's just loading. We are doing that one on the 17th of April, uh, Monday the 17th of April. So um, join us for that one and we'll run through everything you need to know around the new affiliation process. So that is the deck complete. As always, this has been recorded. So what we will do is we will put the link. Uh, so we'll put the video onto our YouTube channel. I will send you a copy of the slide deck first thing tomorrow morning. No, actually, that's a lie. I'll need to wait for the video to process. It will be tomorrow afternoon when the video is processed. I will then send you the slide deck, a link to the recording. Feel free and please do share that with as many people at your club as uh, as you feel it may be appropriate for. And, and then just again, a final thank you for giving up an hour and eight minutes of your Monday night to join us to talk about the club world and the club landscape. Hopefully you've taken away some ideas or maybe it, it, I think tonight's been more about reaffirming some of the really good practice that's taking place. Um, like I said, I will unpick a template. I'll have a go and see if I can pull something together for you. If you want to talk to me about electronic forms, Google Forms, please get in touch. I'm always banging the drum for trying to get as much stuff as we can electronic to make your lives quicker and easier. Um, but if you've got any questions off the back of this, either put it in the chat now or stay on. I can see John's um, or send me a direct email and I'll be happy to assist where we can. So once again, uh, thank you for your time tonight uh, and enjoy the rest of your evenings. You are all free to go. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you.